So how does the kernel make a process? Remember our model introducing in class three? The goal of a process is to provide each program the illusion that it owns a whole machine while it's running. And the way we won't need to do that depends on two things. It depends on getting some share of the processing time, and it depends on giving each program its own isolated memory so other programs don't affect what it's doing. And I'll show a quote from Guy Steele, since I was bashing on the Java designers the last class, deserves to mention that one of the best things that I've seen written about designing languages and computer systems in general is this talk that Guy Steele gave. The theme of the talk is that you can only use one syllable words until you define a longer word. So every word that he uses is either one syllable or defined in terms of one syllable words that he started with. It's a really interesting talk, but he does start defining what an operating system is. And he says it's a program that keeps track of other programs and gives each its due in space and time. So far, we've mostly just talked about time. We've talked about using preemptive scheduling to give each a fair share of time. What he means by space is memory. Each program should have the illusion that it owns memory independently from other programs. So that's what we're going to talk about today, how to do that. Our goal is to have some large physical memory, be able to run multiple processes in it, and each process is going to have its own memory space. And they should not be able to access the other process's memory space. Do we need special hardware support to do this? Oh, good. So there certainly is a lot of specialized hardware to support this on an x86. Do we? OK. So how do you know we don't have to have it? Do any of you use systems that run programs with isolated memory but not taking advantage of hardware mechanisms? I think almost all of you are carrying around devices that you can go to stores, app stores, or uh, Play Market, or whatever the Apple one is called, and download apps from people you don't trust and run them on your phone. Would you want to do that if they weren't isolated? So you probably don't want to do that anyway, because they still have access to most, you know, if you aren't real careful about not running programs that don't ask for all the permissions they ask for, they already have access to all your most sensitive stuff on your phone. But they're at least supposed to be isolated in memory. There are underlying hardware mechanisms on the processor on those phones. But the apps are running above those. Right? All the things that are running as Android apps, they're running within a system that is providing this isolation mostly through software mechanisms. So there's no requirement that you have hardware support for this as long as you can control how programs are loaded. As an example of that, we could rewrite instructions. So we could have low-level instructions, any x86 binary, in order to provide memory isolation, what we need to do is look at any time it does something that accesses memory and restrict what it can access. So we could sandbox the code. Right? If the original code had an instruction like this that is moving from this location, from the RAX register, into some location in memory that is an offset from the RBP, from the base pointer. Unless we know what value is in RBP, this may or may not be safe. It may be accessing some other process's memory, because RBP could hold anything at this point. So we could sandbox it. And the way to sandbox it would be if we have some special register. So we're going to have a special register that is protected. So that means only the trusted higher level program can write into that, which could be the kernel, but it could be at a lower level. It could be the web browser that's doing this if you're running your code loading through a web browser. We're going to and the target address with what's in that register. If any of the bits in the target address don't match that mask, we're going to wipe them out. And that means only addresses that are valid in the valid memory space will get through to here, that will be in this value of RDX at the time we, we do the move. So we could rewrite every move instruction, every other instruction that uses memory, to make sure that it's safe. We don't really need any special hardware mechanisms for this. What I've showed you is actually this was what was proposed in this 1993 paper that was doing software-based fault isolation. And it's doing something very close to this transformation that I showed you, of taking every attempt the program would make to access memory and putting a few extra instructions around it to mask out anything that might be unsafe. A more modern view of this is native client, which is embedded in, in Chrome. And this allows you to run native code in a web browser so to get really good performance without giving that code access to the whole process of the web browser. So you're not worried. The kernel's worried about programs interfering with each other in separate processes. In a web browser, 
you've got the web browser process and you're starting lots of other code running in that process. Any plugin, any JavaScript on the page, all these things are running. And what native client allows you to do is run x86 code within the web browser, but in a way that's safe, that it can't bash on the memory of other things that are inside the web browser. And it does it using exactly the same kinds of techniques that I talked about, where it's masking before it allows you to jump to what's stored in EAX, it's anding it with this. So what is that, that hex value? Why are there all those Fs there? So what, what happens when you and a value with that? Good, right? So all the ones, so all these Fs, right, are all ones. And then the rest of it, there's some zeros at the end. I may have miscounted how many. Right, so if you're anding things, the and doesn't affect what you anded with. So you're keeping all the higher order bits the same. The zero and the E, so the E ends with a zero, and then this zero, I guess, is four, four zeros. The zeros at the end, well, they all turn into zeros, whatever was in the original value. So this is forcing all jumps to be aligned. This is saying that you can only jump to locations that end in all these zeros. And that makes it a lot easier to analyze the code to know that you're not jumping around the code that's checking that you're allowed to access a resource, for example. That you can't jump to any arbitrary location, you can only jump to these aligned safe locations. So we don't need any special hardware protection to isolate programs. But we still have it. For the kernel isolating processes, this is almost all done with hardware protection. The loader is not changing anything. It's letting through whatever arbitrary instructions the programmer put there or the compiler generated. And then at the time it runs, let's say this is process one, if this location is in process one memory space, everything's fine, it goes ahead. If it's somewhere else, the hardware is gonna trap that and not allow that memory to be accessed. And then it's gonna go into the operating system to figure out how to deal with it. So that's what virtual memory gives us. We're gonna take all the addresses that we see in programs and map them to a physical address owned by that process. It's up to the virtual memory mapping to do that mapping. We need to make sure that user level processes cannot affect how that mapping is done. If a user level process could change that mapping, well maybe they could access memory from some other process's space. Who sets up the memory, the memory map? So if we can't allow user level process to do it, who can actually affect the memory map? Yeah, so this is up to the kernel. It should only be possible when you're in supervisor mode, only the kernel should be able to affect the things that affect the virtual memory map. 